I, I don't know how many malapropisms I had in that little clip, but there was a few. His metabolism and his uh, parfaiting it into a camper. Uh, but the, the donut eating contest led into an investment opportunity, and Cy, uh, he won the bet, and then he went all in on the camper, and that's the second point that's a little more appropriate for what we're talking about today. Uh, I'm going to begin by um, reading the first part, actually the, the bulk of the parable that I've just put the tail end of it on your, in your notebook. I put Matthew 25, 23 in your notebook because the rest of it takes too long to print, so I figured I'd just read it to you today. This is one of Jesus' more well-known parables. It's one of my favorites, and we're going to end our season on it today. So this is Jesus' teaching in Matthew 25, and I'll read the parable, and we'll finish with the verse that's in your notebook. Jesus said, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a great parable. It's a powerful parable. And we're going to try to apply it to the curriculum we've been looking at all year. Driven, seeing God's work in your work. The first thing we can see in the parable as Jesus teaches it is that God calls us to our work. Now, as work, we mean both that which we do for a living and that which we do simply to serve God. So work encompasses our professions and our calling as Christian men to serve God. God calls us to our work. Now, when we think of Jesus, most often we think of the, the spiritual side of things. We think of the cross and resurrection. We're heading into the Easter season right now, and that's what we should think. We think of him as son of God. We think of him as the miracle worker. We think of him as Savior and Lord. And those are the most important ways we need to think about Christ. But Jesus was also a masterful teacher. He was a great storyteller. He used everyday uh, stories to teach spiritual truth. Uh, if you read the New Testament, you see Jesus told stories about farming, about fishing, about wedding banquets, about unpaid debts, about wayward children. And he turned them into stories where we could see ourselves in them and learn spiritual truth. Now here, he uses a work setting. He uses the setting of a, of a boss and employees to build one of his most well-known parables. Personally, I like to call this the parable of the crazy boss and the, and the lazy mid-level manager. The parable of the crazy boss and the lazy mid-level ma ma manager. And the, and the beauty of these parables is that we can always find ourselves in the story. Any parable you read of Christ in the New Testament, you're in the story somewhere. And that's the challenge is to find yourself in the story. This one is pretty easy. There are uh, two characters. There's the master, the boss, the one who owns everything. And that's not us in this parable. Uh, we're not there. Uh, we are in the next character, which is the three servants. There are three servants, sort of employees. And here's where we find ourselves. Now, to help the, you make sense of the story, you need to know that a talent in that day was a measure of weight. It was the measure of weight of either gold or silver. So it really signified an amount of money. In fact, some of your Bibles, if you read them, actually call this parable the story of the bags of money. Uh, so uh, how much was it worth? 
Well, most scholars estimate the value of one talent in Jesus' day to be roughly 20 years' worth of wages for a common employee, a common laborer. So it's a lot of money. If we go into our world today, we know that a talent in that day was about 75 pounds. That was the measure of weight. And if you put that into gold today, with the price of gold, it'd be somewhere around one and a half million dollars for one talent. Just to make it easy on us, let's assume that one talent was a million bucks in our money. So this is not small change. This is significant money. It would have got people's attention in that day. It's like Warren Buffett calling in some of his uh, employees, uh, maybe mid-level guys, or Bill Gates calling them in and saying, I'm going to give you each amount of money. I'm going away for a while. And he gives one uh, five million bucks, he gives one two million bucks, gives one one million bucks. And that's a significant story. So that's, that's the setup of the story. Now notice the expectation here. In Jesus' story, the boss, the master, um, has expectations. First of all, notice he trusts these employees. He trusts them with his own property. He gives it to them, trusting that they will then take it and invest it and do something with it that contributes back to his business, his wealth, his kingdom. That's where the story starts. So God expects us to work. He calls us to our work. Secondly, he expects us to invest ourselves boldly in our work. God expects to, us to invest ourselves boldly. I have to admit, for a long time, even uh, after seminary days, uh, this parable bothered me a little bit. I'd read it, uh, I'd understand it, write papers on it, but it bothered me a little bit. And here's why it bothered me. The five-talent guy goes and invests what the boss gives him. Don't know how he invests it. Don't know if he starts a business, whether he, uh, we don't know what he does. Uh, Jesus doesn't say that, but he does invest it. And he doubles it to 10. So the 5 million bucks becomes 10, 10 million bucks. The two-talent guy invests what the boss gives him. And he doubles it, it becomes 4 million. The one-talent guy, knowing full well that it's not his money. He knows the money belongs to the boss, Right? And so he's afraid to lose it. He knows he's going to be asked for it back. He doesn't want to make a huge mistake, so he buries it in the ground. Okay? So that when the boss comes back, which he knows he will someday, and he knows he's going to settle accounts, he'll have exactly what the boss gave him. Okay? Now, if I'm honest, I have to say that I can relate to that guy. When I read the story, I think, well, there's a certain... I can sort of understand that way of thinking. I tend to be a little bit conservative by nature, a little risk averse in a lot of situations, especially involving resources or money, kind of by nature. So I can understand that, that careful approach. I just don't want to lose anything. I want to give him exactly what he gave me. But then the surprise of the parable is the boss comes back, he settles accounts, and he goes ballistic on this guy. He says... Really? Really? That's all you did? You took my resources, I trusted you, and you just buried it in the ground? You knew I was going to ask for it back. At least you should have put it in a bank and got interest. And then he says, you wicked, lazy servant. And he takes what he had and gives it to the guy who has 10. My mind, I just go, what? What? Where's the sense of that? That doesn't sound like Jesus to me. At least not the Jesus I thought of then. I used to think that the right one talent guy got a raw deal until I met a guy named Randy about 25 years ago, maybe longer than that. One of the very first mission trips I took at this church was with high school students to rural Mexico. In fact, Brian Lumberg was here last week. He was on that very first trip. He was 14 years old. We took a group of seven kids down to rural Mexico to work with a project called Food for the Hungry. Very rural, a rugged project. A couple kids got really sick. It was, a, it was kind of a bad deal. Uh, that's where we learned to check out all our sites ahead of time. Anyway, uh, there was another team down there at the same time uh, from Colorado, a team of young adults. I had high school kids. These guys were all in their 20s. And it was led by a guy named Kent, great guy. And one of the guys on his team was this 25-year-old guy or so named Randy. And Randy had cerebral palsy. So Randy struggled to walk. He, wa he, had walk he, he wore crutches on his arms, and he sort of dragged his legs around. And it was very rural. Uh, no pa pathways were all rutted. And, and, uh, and it was just, Randy was tough to have on the trip. Great guy, but he was tough to have on the trip. He needed help all the time. But he was on the trip. The main project we were working on there in this was, uh, was, was digging irrigation ditches in this farm field where they were going to uh, create, uh, they were creating a, um, 
income for low-income families, and they were growing rice, uh, growing uh, beans and corn and stuff like that. So we were preparing this field to be planted. So we were out there every day, early in the morning, and we were digging by hand these irrigation ditches, like four feet deep, a couple feet wide. It was back-breaking work, but that's what we went there to do. So we were out there working in the fields, doing the digging with the, back, with the big pickaxes and stuff like that. Randy couldn't do that work. He needed help even going to the bathroom. Every time he had to go to the outhouse, he had to walk with them because he'd fall and trip and do stuff like that. It always took somebody being with Randy. Randy couldn't do that work with the field because he was obviously physically limited. So the work he had to do, he had to sit all day on a little concrete slab, and he'd put, uh, uh, he took little plastic bags, filled them with dirt soil, and stuck seeds in them for later to be planted while we were doing the digging of the ditches. Okay, you got the scenario. So Randy sat there five or six hours a day putting seeds in bags and dirt in bags because he couldn't do the work, real work out in the field with us. We did that like five days. And one of the, la the last day we were gonna be out there digging in the irrigation ditches, we were all out lined up digging on the, um, uh, digging, and we stop and, and we see Randy on his way out to the field. And he's got, talked to one of the Mexican guys into carrying a chair for him so there's a guy walking out with a chair, somebody else kind of stabilizing Randy as he's walking with his crutches, dragging himself out to the, to the field. We're, and we all stop. We're going, what's Randy doing? And Kent is next to me, Randy's leader, and Kent's kind of muttering to himself, what's he doing? What's he doing? Randy gets all the way out to us, and Kent looks at Randy and goes, Randy, what are you doing? And Randy just goes, I want to dig, Kent. So we all got quiet, we set the chair down. Randy sat in the chair and he got a pickaxe. And now Randy's upper body was quite strong because he dragged himself with his crutches all the time. But he, so he's sitting on this chair in the, on this, this ditch in front of him and he takes the pickaxe and he just reaches in softly one time to make sure he has his balance, pulls a little dirt out, swings harder the second time. And on about the third swing, he swings the pick so hard, he flips himself off his chair head first into the ditch. Okay, so we're all standing there watching him. Kent's next to me. Randy's head first in the ditch with his feet sticking out like that. So we all run over. We drag Randy. We pull him up out of the ditch. His face is bloody. He's got dirt stuck to his face. And we sit him in the chair. And Kent is kind of frustrated now. I don't know the history between the two, but Kent's frustrated. He goes, Randy, what are you doing? And Randy looks up. I'll never forget. As long as I live. Looked a big old toothy grin, dirt clod hanging off his face. He goes, Kent, I'm just serving Jesus. What are you doing here? And we all got dead quiet. And we realized that of all of us there, the one who invested himself most boldly was Randy. Okay? Randy wasn't a five-talent guy. He wasn't a two-talent guy. If you had asked me before that day, maybe not even a one-talent guy. I was frustrated he was on the trip. He took time. You had to always be watching out for Randy. I kept thinking, why is he even here? But that day, he taught me why he was there. What he had, he invested boldly, all in, buried nothing in the ground, and we all came away from that trip learning from him what it meant to live for Christ. So what's Jesus saying to us here? He's invested his resources in us. He expects us to invest those resources boldly for his kingdom. And thirdly, he's telling us that God will reward work well done. God will reward work well done. Most of you guys know I played basketball way back in the day uh, when I still had all my body parts and so forth. And part of the reason was what happened to me in sixth grade. I loved sports growing up, but in sixth grade, I played on a little intramural basketball team at lunchtime at school. We didn't have coaches or anything. The boys just put together teams. We played. And in the sixth grade, um, my teacher was a guy named Mr. Kandari, who also happened to be the high school varsity basketball coach in our town, but he was my sixth grade teacher. So I looked up to him and respected him. I'd been to high school games. I'd seen high school games and so forth. And I wanted to be that someday. But in sixth grade, we had this little inter intramural team, and we made the championship game of the intramurals in sixth grade. And so they had all the classes come out. I don't know how many kids it was. It felt like it was a huge crowd, but it was this little tiny little middle school gym. And we played the championship game at lunchtime, and uh, we won the game by like one point or something. And, and, and Mr. Gandari was there watching. And as the game ended, we walked off or celebrated. We won the intramural championship in sixth grade. He stepped out of, the cra out of the stands and walked out to meet me. And he stuck his hand out and shook my hand. As I shook his hand, he said, good job. 
And I knew what he was doing because I'd been to high school games. I saw him do that to the high school players after they won a game. He'd step out and he'd say, good job. And I can't tell you what that meant to a sixth grade boy to have the high school coach come out, shake my hand, and said, you did good. And that's a lot of the reason why I ended up playing basketball in high school and on into college because he rewarded me for a job well done. As men, we are built for reward. We want to know we did a good job. We need to know we did a good job. And the Bible says that God will reward. In fact, the Bible talks about two rewards. The first reward is salvation, which is by faith alone. We've covered that over the last few years. It's the gospel. No one can earn their way into salvation. No one can buy their way in. Salvation is by grace alone. It's by faith in what God did for us. Uh, We are all going to stand before God someday, every single one of us. And not a one of us is going to get there because we deserve to be there. And when the one question is asked, it won't be, how often did you go to church? Where did you go to church? How much money did you give? The question will be, what did you do with my son? What did you do with the cross? What did you do with the resurrection? What did you do with my son? We are saved by his grace, by forgiveness of sin. That's how we're saved. That's the first reward, is salvation, eternal life. But the Bible also teaches there's a second kind of reward. A second kind of judgment for believers, and it's the reward of faithfulness or service. The New Testament talks about crowns in four or five places. Crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory. Those sort of victor's wreaths that will be rewarded to those uh, based on their service, based on their faithfulness. And scholars believe these crowns, these rewards, have to do with the honor and service that will be bestowed by Christ in the new heaven and new earth. That we will be be given jobs to do. We will be given service to render, responsibilities in the new heaven and the earth commensurate to our service and faithfulness in this lifetime now. That's what most scholars believe. And that's the reward Jesus is talking about in this parable when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. You've been faithful with the resources I've given you. You've been faithful in the work I've given you to do. You've been faithful in the service I've given you opportunity to do. You've been faithful with what I've given you, so I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. He's talking about the next life. He's talking about what he will assign us in that life to come. We don't know what that is. We don't know exactly what that will be, but we know that we will serve him forever and ever and ever as we reign with him in the new heaven and new earth. So now we come full circle in our curriculum this year. We said way back at the beginning of this year that the fundamental understanding of Scripture is that you don't work for your earthly boss. I don't work for my boss here. You don't work for your company. If we understand Scripture correctly, you work, we all work, for the God who created us to work. We work for the God who invested his resources in us, the God who even now is preparing the reward that each one of us will receive on that day. That's why we work. That's who we work for. And that's what it means to be a follower of Christ.